Well, I, I can announce that uh, the State of the Union is strong, <laughs> uh, or will be if you turn off your cell phones, please. Uh, and the state of the creative writing program is very strong. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, our regular uh, faculty back who are going to read to you tonight. Uh, Derek has been with us this year but can't be here this evening. He and the rest of us will uh, return uh, next year. The one announcement to make really is that we are in the process of transforming our program from an MA in creative writing to a Master of Fine Arts in creative writing, though nothing really will change but the title of the program or the degree that the program offers. Uh, we still will have students with a uh, slightly scholarly cast to them, but a lot more scholarly, I think, than, than most other programs. Uh, a part of our program we're very proud of and hope to keep. But uh, the graduating within a year or now, if you wish, within two years, all that will remain the same. Tonight we're going to begin uh, with David Ferry. Uh, uh, we are so grateful to have uh, David, who is actually a regular member of the program, because the, the, with the eight of us, there's always someone uh, away. And David um, graciously steps in for that person every year. Um, one part of our program, indeed, that we're very proud of is the translation portion of it. Uh, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about it later when Rosanna comes up. But it's important, I think, uh, that to know that David Ferry is not only a gorgeous modern poet, but uh, a great translator of Horace and Virgil. He did the Gilgamesh. And I think that his uh, modern sensibility as a poet refines, in some ways makes more exact, the ancient sensibility of those he translates. You'll hear now from your, uh, for yourselves, David Ferry. Thank you. I'm going to read <clears throat> one passage from uh, Virgil's Georgics and then read one or two poems of my own that are somehow related to that passage. Um, um, Eurydice, the wife of Orpheus, the greatest singer uh, ever, the, the prototype of singers, has died, and um, Orpheus goes to the underworld to try to retrieve her for uh, life again. Um, alone upon the unfrequented shore, Orpheus, playing his lyre, sang to himself his songs of you, dear wife, as day came on with the light of the morning sun and as the light descended in the evening. Singing, he went down through the very throat of Tenerus, the high gate of the dark kingdom of Dis, and through the murky grove where terror dwells in black obscurity, and entered into the Manes place, the place of the dreadful king, and the hearts no human prayers can cause to pity. And set in motion by the sound of music, from the lowest depths of Erebus there came, as numerous as the many hundred birds that are driven there by the coming on of evening or by a winter storm, fly in for shelter in the foliage of a grove, the flittering shades, the unsubstantial phantom shapes of those for whom, whom there is not any light at all, women and men, Famous, great-hearted heroes, the life in their hero bodies now defunct, unmarried boys and girls, sons whom their fathers had had to watch being placed on the funeral pyre, and all around them the hideous tangling weeds and the black ooze of Coquito's swampy waters. Nine times Styx wound its, its uh, fettering chain around them, and the house of death was spellbound by his music all the way down to the bottom of Tartarus, spellbound the snakes in the, bar, in the, in the, in the hair of the Furies uh, too, and Cerberus, the hell dogs, all three mouths, were open-mouthed and silent, forgetting to bark. 
The wind was still, and Ixion's wheel stopped turning. And now, as he was carefully going back, the way he came, and step by step avoiding all possible wrong steps, and step by step Eurydice, whom he was bringing back unseen behind his back, was following, for this is what Proserpina had commanded. They were coming very near the upper air, and a sudden madness seized him, madness of love, a madness to be forgiven if hell but knew how to forgive. He stopped in his tracks, and there, then, just as they were just about to emerge out into the light, suddenly, seized by love, bewildered into heedlessness, alas, his purpose overcome, he turned and looked back at Eurydice, and then and there his labor was spilled and flowed away like water. The implacable tyrant broke the pact three times, the pools of Avernus, heard the sound of water. I heard the, I'm sorry, the, the pools of Avernus heard the sound of thunder. What was it, she cried? What madness, Orpheus, was it that has destroyed us? You and me, oh look, the cruel fates already call me back, and sleep is covering over my swimming eyes. Farewell. I'm being carried off into the vast surrounding dark and reaching out my strengthless hands to you forevermore, alas, not yours. And saying this, like smoke disintegrating into air, she was dispersed away and vanished from his eyes and never saw him again. And he was left clutching at shadows with so much still to say. And the boatman never again would take him across the barrier of the marshy waters of hell. What could he do? His wife twice taken from him. How could he bear it? How could his tears move hell? The Stygian boat has carried her away. And this is a poem called Lake Water. It is a summer afternoon in October. I am sitting on a wooden bench, looking out at the lake through a tall screen of evergreens, or rather, looking out across the plain of the lake, seeing the light shaking upon the water as if it were a shimmering of heat. Yesterday when I sat here, it was the same, the same displaced out of season effect. Seen twice, it seemed a truth was being told. Some of the trees I can see across the lake have begun to change, but it is as if the air had entirely given itself over to summer with the intention of denying its own proper nature. There is a breeze perfectly steady and persistent blowing in towards shore from the other side or from the world beyond the other side. The mild sound of the little tapping waves the breeze has caused, there's something infantile about it, a baby at the breast. The light is moving and not moving upon the water. The breeze picks up slightly, but still steadily. The increase in the breeze becomes the mild dominant event, compelling with sweet oblivious authority alterations in light and shadow, alterations in the light of the sun on the water, which becomes at once denser and more quietly excited, like a concentration of emotions that had been dispersed and scattered, and now were not. Then there's the mitigation of the shadow of a cloud, and the light subsides a little as if into itself. Although this is like a lake, it is as if a tide were running mildly into shore. The sound of the water so softly battering against the shore is decidedly sexual in its liquidity, its regularity, its persistence, its infantile obliviousness. It is as if it had come back to being a beginning, an origination of life. The plane of the water is like a page on which phrases and even sentences are written. But because of the breeze and the turning of the year and the sense that this lake water, as it is being experienced on a particular day, comes from some source somewhere beneath, within itself, or from somewhere else nearby, a spring, a brook, its pure origination somewhere else. It is like an idea for a poem 
not yet written and maybe never to be completed because the surface of the page is like a lake water that takes back what is written on its surface. And all my language about the lake and its emotions or its sweet obliviousness or even its being like an origination is all erased with the changing of the breeze or because of the heedless passing of a cloud. When moments after she died, I looked into her face, it was as untelling as something natural, a lake, say, the surface of it unreadable, its sources of meaning unfindable anymore. Her mouth was open as if she had something to say, but maybe my saying so is a figure of speech. And then conclude with a poem called Resemblance. It was my father in that restaurant on Central Avenue in Orange, New Jersey, where I stopped for lunch and a drink after coming away from visiting after many years had passed the place to which I brought my father's ashes and the ashes of my mother and where my father's grandparents, parents, brothers had been buried and others of the family all together. The atmosphere was smoky and there was a vague struggling transaction going on between the bright daylight of the busy street outside and the somewhat dirty light of the unwashed ceiling globes of the restaurant I was in. He was having lunch. I couldn't see what he was having, but he seemed to be eating, maybe without noticing whatever it was he may have been eating. He seemed to be listening to a conversation with two or three others. Shades of the dead come back from where they went to when they went away? Or maybe those others weren't speaking at all? Maybe it was a dumb show put on for my benefit? It was the eerie persistence of his not seeming to recognize that I was there, watching him from my table across the room. It was also the sense of his being included in the conversation around him, and yet not, Though this in life had been familiar to me, no great change from what had been there before, even in my sense that I, across the room, was excluded, which went along with my sense of him when he was alive, that often he didn't feel included in the scenes and talk around him, and his isolation itself excluded others. <clears throat> Where were we in that restaurant that day? Had I gone down into the world of the dead? Were those other people really shades of the dead? We expected if they came back, they would come back to impart some knowledge of what it was they had learned. Or if this was indeed down there, then they down there would reveal to us who visit them in a purified language some truth that in our condition of being alive, we are unable to know. Their tongues are ashes when they'd speak to us. Unable to know is a condition I've lived in all my life, a poverty of imagination about the life of another human being. This is, I think, the case with everyone. Is it because there is a silence that we are all of us forbidden to cross, not only the silence that divides the dead from the living, but antecedent to that, is it the silence there is between the living and the living? Unable to reach across that silence through the baffling light there always is between us. Among the living, the body can do so, so sometimes, but the mind, constricted, inhibited by its ancestral knowledge of final separation, holds back, unable to complete what it wanted to say. What is your name that I can call you by? Virgil said, when Eurydice died again, there was still so much to say that had not been said even before her first death from which he had vainly attempted with his singing to rescue her. Thank you.
Uh, I can't resist commenting on what I just heard because David made my point. I said a gorgeous poet. Um, I said the bringing together of the antique and the, and the modern, so the Eurydice, in these poems of loss, the two, the two are brought together. Eurydice disintegrating like smoke in the air. And then something, I forget what, the surface of the lake mitigated by the shadow of a cloud. Very beautiful lines. Uh, now for a novelist. Uh, we are no less proud to have Jennifer Haig on our faculty. Uh, she writes two novels. She wins two major prizes, uh, the Penn Hemingway, uh, the Thomas Winship Award for, I think, respectively, Mrs. Kimball and Baker's Towers. Um, a third novel we published as underway and we published next year. And who can imagine what wonderful prizes she'll win for that? Uh, what I like is she's a tough, demanding teacher uh, for our students, right? And, uh, and what I also like is that she sends me these great emails about uh, Mormons digging up dead Jews and converting them uh, after a... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's something that goes on. <laughs> I don't know if she's going to read about that, but uh, I think it's going to be from the new novel, Jennifer Hay. My emails are nowhere near as good as what Leslie makes of them. That's terrific. Um, I'm going to do something tonight that I find slightly terrifying. I'm going to read from my novel in progress, something I've not done before. For the past couple of years, I've been writing this book called The Condition. It's a story about a family with grown children. And the section I'm going to read concerns the youngest son, Scott, and his wife, Penny. They met on a camping trip in 1986. The spring, Scott fled Dinsmore College under cover of night, having spent his tuition check on an aging Pontiac Sunbird and a large quantity of marijuana, which his towny friend Magic Dave had packed loosely into a Wonder Bread wrapper and double-bagged for freshness. For three days, Scott drove in a straight line westward, his bag of wonder, his wonderful bag, stashed beneath the passenger seat. He slept a night in Buffalo, Wyoming, then drove the last 40 miles to Yellowstone, where he planned to meet up with some buddies on spring break. He never found them. The park was as wide as New Hampshire. Scott had spent his whole life in New England. Nature was Cape Cod, its cottages and clam shacks, Walden Pond, an oasis in the suburbs. The high, empty plains spooked him. The landscape seemed haunted and mournful. He felt, and was, a thousand miles away from the mess he'd left at school, the dean who had it in for him, the irate phone calls from his father, the weepy disappointment of his girlfriend, Jane Frayne, who would never speak to him again. In March, the park was deserted. He hiked a day and a half before he saw the smoke of a campfire. By then, his feet were blistered, his water supply gone. He'd shivered all night in his summer weight sleeping bag. He approached the campsite, two dilapidated tents pitched at the top of a hill. A girl crouched before the fire. Hello, he called in a friendly tone. Alone in the wilderness, she would be scared of strangers. Can I borrow your fire? The girl stood. She wore blue jeans and a bikini top. Her head was wrapped in a blue bandana. Two yellow braids trailed down her back. Sure, she said, come on up. He scrambled up the hill, his blistered feet burning. The girl sat on her haunches, poking at the fire. In a moment, he understood why she wore so little. The fire gave off a blistering heat. He took a joint from his pocket, and they passed it between them, drawing heroic breaths. What did they talk about that night? For the life of him, he couldn't recall. He remembered only how slowly she spoke, how relaxed and reflective and content she seemed, how unlike Jane Frayne, who spoke in whole paragraphs and slept five hours a night, yet refused to temper her energy by chemical means. Pot made her paranoid, she said, and beer was a waste of calories. 
to Scott, who got high once or twice a day, this seemed an irreconcilable defect in their relationship. Jane's unwillingness to follow him to the place where he was most completely himself. That night, staring into the fire next to Penny Cherry, he saw this with utter clarity and decided he had been right to leave. There was no turning back. They squatted by the fire until his thighs ached. He noticed, but did not care, that sweat was running down his back, soaking his cotton turtleneck. Penny noticed, too. Take off your shirt, she said, and he did, a little self-consciously. Three and a half semesters of beer and college food had padded his torso. This girl was lean as a deer, a wild creature. Men's jeans, whose, he wondered, hung low on her hips. It was full dark when the others arrived. They brought fresh trout for the night's supper, caught out of season pounds of slippery contraband. Scott washed them in hushed awe, like wildlife glimpsed through his binoculars. They were tanned, handsome people in boots and battered jeans. The females were wide-eyed, long-haired, unadorned. The largest male had a web of paisley tattoos snaking down his forearms. The others lacked distinctive markings, but appeared fast and strong. Scott looked for mated pairs, but the arithmetic eluded him. Three girls, including Penny, and four guys. They assembled the dinner in cooperative fashion, with affectionate touching all around. A squat Mexican named Tony kissed each girl's mouth. Scott kept his eyes on Penny to determine whose she might be. Anybody's, it seemed. But after the fish was eaten, a bottle of whiskey passed. It was Scott's hand she had taken, Scott she had led silently into the woods. She was a California girl born in North Hollywood, a dump back then, she admitted, but an easy drive to Burbank, where her father, Wizard Dooley, had worked as a TV stuntman. He appeared mainly in a detective series called Vegas Jack, but he'd done movies, too. Penny rattled off a list of titles, Death Rangers, Rage on Wheels, The San Antonio Outlaws, but only one, The French Connection, was familiar to Scott. Wizard Dooley had doubled for Robert Wagner, James Gardner, and once, famously, for Steve McQueen, whom people said he resembled. Penny's mother, Gloria, a former Miss Fresno County, was Wizard's high school sweetheart. They'd come to Hollywood in the late 60s when Penny's older sister was just a baby, to the scorn of both their families, who called Wizard a dreamer and a deadbeat, and Gloria a ninny who was throwing her life away with both hands. Wizard proved them all wrong by finding work immediately, thanks to a motorcycle buddy named Vince Bragg, who did stunt work on Vegas Jack, until he flipped his bike in the desert and landed beneath it. It was Wizard who took Bragg to the hospital to have his femur set, and Bragg repaid the favor by sending Wizard to the Vegas Jack set in his place. The director loved Wizard, who was as fearless as Bragg, but younger and better looking. His resemblance to the show's star made shooting a breeze. Wizard enhanced the effect by bleaching his hair and growing a handlebar mustache. Vegas Jack, a little boy once cried, pointing to him in the street. Penny was seven when Wizard left, for what she called the usual reasons. Somebody had screwed somebody or was thought to have done so. She was the last in the family to see Wizard alive. She was walking home from the school bus stop when she saw his lemon yellow Chevelle pull out of the driveway. The windows were down, AM radio blasting. Wizard seemed not to see her as he threw the car into gear. Daddy, she called, holding aloft her lunchbox in a clumsy wave. The car rolled past her, then abruptly squealed to a stop. Wizard stepped out and ambled toward her, his hair wild, his face red. He wore a pink plaid shirt that was Penny's favorite, with pearly snaps down the front. These details she would remember forever. They were hers and hers alone, like the velvet-lined box of rhinestone jewelry she kept under her bed, a plastic ballerina twirling inside. Hey, baby, he said, a little breathless, and scooped her into his arms. He had not shaved. His rough neck was warm and tangy, the beery smell she loved. Over his shoulder, she saw the car packed full with boxes, his guitar case, and what looked like, but couldn't be, oh no, the family ping pong table folded in half. The gaping hatchback was secured with rope. Where are you going? She did not ask. 
I'm leaving you forever, he did not answer. I will call you once a year, next year on Christmas, and give your mother a phone number that will soon be disconnected. I will race cars and live with a dancer in Nevada who, after I drive into a wall at 100 miles an hour, will send you a box of worthless crap that will tell you nothing about why I left nothing at all. You're so pretty, he said instead. Never cut your hair. She watched him get into the car. The door didn't close the first time. He reopened it and slammed it harder. Driving away, he stretched his left arm out the open window as if he meant to pull her along behind him. He turned at the corner and was gone. There were stepfathers. Henry Cherry was a widower with five sons. He came to town on business. Gloria met him at the steakhouse where she'd been hired for her looks. Soon they moved into Cherry's sprawling ranch house on the outskirts of Boise, a low-slung place on six flat acres of grass. In Idaho, they heard services and did chores. Penny picked vegetables from the garden, fed chickens, gathered eggs. In North Hollywood, her mother had been a casual housekeeper, toast crumbs on the counter, blue toothpaste misfires in the sink. Now, at Relief Society meetings, she learned pickling and preserving. Cherry's first wife had amassed a large collection of canning equipment, ball jars boiled dull and smooth. To Penny, who had recently eaten crackers for dinner, the transformation was alarming. She retreated to the hills behind the Cherry house with her youngest stepbrother, Benji, who scarcely spoke but could climb like a goat. Benji had been left back in school and was called slow, but he knew the names of trees and flowers, the scat of deer, antelope, and moose, Benji saw the shapes of constellations, the warriors and goddesses hidden in the stars. It was Benji who kept her company until her mother's marriage collapsed, for reasons Penny did not know, but could guess. She told Scott this, all this, their first night together. At the time, it fascinated him, the twists and turns of the story, its exotic western locales. Soon, though, there was a burden in so much knowing. This strange girl confiding her heartbreaks, her childhood terrors, believing Scott the first man who would never fail her. He was 19 years old. That summer, they rented an apartment at the beach in La Jolla, where Penny found a job in a surf shop. They bought a VCR and rented a copy of The French Connection, a film she had never seen. Together, they watched the credits scroll past, the names of stunt men long retired or, like her father, violently killed. Twice, three times, Penny rewound the tape, but no wizard dually was listed in the credits. About that, about everything, her father had lied. back to a poet and uh, one of our poet laureates, uh, Robert Pinsky. Um, as I've said before, maybe each year that I've been up here, I think uh, Robert has done more first to revive and then integrate poetry into American life than maybe anybody since Walt Whitman. Uh, and uh, what makes me proudest of uh, Robert, well, it's something I believe, and what makes me pri uh, proudest about Robert is that when his laureateship, an extraordinary one, was over, uh, he remained committed to the project and the favorite poem project, and he's committed to it still, uh, still working at this wonderful task. Uh, as you know, he's written many books of poetry. His last book, I believe, though, was the book on David. And um, though there's another book, uh, a terrific book of poems called First Things to Hand, uh, only a chap book, you say, uh, but by what a chap. Robert Pinsky. As I understand about the Mormons, they don't actually dig up the Jews. <laughs> I th that, that's Leslie's touch, isn't it? They just, in theory, baptize them. <laughs> and that's true. 
And uh, I, I have an organization of Jews. We actually posthumously circumcise all Mormons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a new book of poems coming out in the fall. It will be called Gulf Music. It will include the Chet book, First Things to Hand. And uh, I will read the last poem in it, uh, which translates, uh, it translates uh, four or five uh, uh, tercets from the very last uh, canto of Dante's Paradiso, though I skip one tercet. It's the tercet in which St. Bernard tells Dante where to look. And Dante himself says, I was already looking there. <laughs> From the last canto of Paradise, Paradiso 33, lines 46 through 48, and 52 through 66. As I drew nearer to the end of all desire, I brought my longing's ardor to a new height, just as I ought. My vision, becoming pure, entered more and more the beam of that high light that shines on its own truth. From then, my seeing became too large for speech, which fails at a sight beyond all boundaries, at memory's undoing, as when the dreamer sees, and after the dream, the passion endures imprinted on his being, though he can't recall the rest. I am the same. Inside my heart, although my vision is almost entirely faded, droplets of its sweetness come. The way the snow dissolves the sun's, the way the sun dissolves the snow's crust. The way in the wind that stirred the light leaves, the oracle that the Sibyl wrote was lost. David's beautiful poems about Orpheus and Eurydice remind me uh, of a poem of mine that will be in the new book that involves Orpheus in such a different way. Uh, I'm skeptical about Orpheus, and my poem is a way of meditating on uh, the selfishness of art, the cruelty of art. The poem is called Keyboard. I have a keyboard in my study where I write. I mean, there's a keyboard in the computer, too, of course, but it's a Casio and I put on headphones, and I play, and nobody can hear how badly I'm playing. <laughs> and uh, if my wife wants to talk to me, she has to say, Ro Robert, ah! <laughs> because you're bur and it's almost like an allegory of the other keyboard and of writing in general. So it seems appropriate. <laughs> keyboard, a disembodied piano. The headphones allow the one who touches the keys a solitude inside his music. Shout, and he may not turn. Image of the soul that thinks to turn from the world. Serpent-scaled Apollo skins the naive musician alive. Then Marcius was sensitive enough to feel the whole world in a touch. In Africa, the raiders with machetes to cut off hands might make the victim choose, long sleeve or short. Shahid Ali says they did it to Kashmiri weavers to kill the art. There are only so many stories. The loss, the chosen, and even before the journey, the turning, the fruit from any tree, the door to any chamber but this one and the greedy soul, blade of the lathe. The Red Army smashed pianos, but once they caught an SS man who could play. They sat him at the piano and pulled their fingers across their throats to explain that they would kill him when he stopped playing. And so for 16 hours they drank and raped while the Nazi fingered the keys. The great song of the world. When he collapsed, sobbing at the instrument, they stroked his head and blew his brains out. Cold-blooded Orpheus turns again to his keyboard to improvise a plaint. 
her little cries of pleasure, blah, blah, the place behind her ear, lilacs in rain, a suscord, a phrase like a moonlit moth in tentative flight, oh, lost Eurydice, blah, blah. His archaic head kept singing after the body was torn away. Body, old long companion, support her. The mist of oranges, la la, the smell of almonds, blah, the taste of olives, her woolen skirt. The great old poet said to us, what should we wear for the reading? Necktie or better no necktie, turtleneck. The head afloat turns toward Apollo to sing, and Apollo, the cool-eyed rainbow lizard, plies the keys. I'll close with another poem about a piano, a piano I loved when I was a child. This is called, this is from my uh, previous book, Jersey Rain. Um, in the past, the poem has always been in this book. Here it is. The Green Piano. Aeolian, gratis, great thunderer, half-ton infant of miracles, torn free of charge from the universe by my mother's will. You must have amazed that half-respectable street of triple-decker families and rooming house house painters the day that the bowl-ankled, oversized hams of your legs bobbed in procession up the crazy paved front walk embraced by the arms of Mr. Popick, the seltzer man, and Corridon, his black-skinned helper, tendering your thighs thick as a man up our steps. We are not reptiles. Even... We are not reptiles. Even the male body bears nipples, as if to remind us we are designed for dependence and nutriment, past into future. Oh, Europe, they budged your case, its ponderous guts of iron and brass, ten kinds of hardwood and felt, up those heel-pocked risers and treads, splintering tinder, angelic nurse of clamor, yearner, dominator, elephant, you were for me. When the tuner, Mr. Van Brunt, pronounced you excellent despite the cracked sounding board, we obeyed him and swabbed your ivories with peroxide. You blocked a doorway and filled most of the living room. The sofa and chairs dwindled to a ram and use. The colored neighbors could be positive that we were crazy and rich, as we thought the people were who gave you away for the moving out of their carriage house. They had painted you the color of pea soup. The drunk man my mother hired never finished antiquing you ivory and umber, so you stood half done, a throbbing, mistreated noble, genuine, my mother's swollen livestock of love, lost one, unmastered. You were the beast she led to the shrine of my genius, mistaken. Endlessly, I bonged, according to my own chord system, humoresque the talk of the town, what I say. Then, one day, they painted you pink. <laughs> pink is how my sister remembers you the Saturday afternoon when our mother fell on her head. Dusty pink, as I turn on the bench in my sister's memory to see them carrying our mother up the last steps and into the living room, inaugurating the reign of our confusion, head injury. They sued the builder of the house she fell in. With the settlement, they bought a house at last. And one day, when I came home from college, you were gone, mahogany breast, who nursed me through those years of the concussion. And there was a crappy little Baldwin acrosonic in your place, gleaming, walnut shell. You were gone, oh, despoiled one, pink one, forever green one, white and gold one, comforter, a living soul. You know, Robert, I don't know how we're going to settle this. <laughs> it, they dug them up, right? <laughs> well, where do you where do you think Mitt Romney is this minute? <laughs> <laughs> a 
few years ago, uh, we decided, and I'm so happy we did, to invite an alternate years, uh, a recent poet uh, or a graduate of our poetry pro program uh, or, gra or a fiction writer uh, who had graduated from the program. And uh, this year we uh, decided to invite, uh, and I think it's a wonderful story, Catherine Tudish, who graduated not recently, but some 20 years ago. Uh, it's a wonderful thing when uh, students persevere. And sometimes it takes 20 years to get over our program. <laughs> uh, but there arrived at BU in my box this book um, called Tenney's Landing, a, a book like uh, literally 100 others uh, that have come in from our grads. And we always, um, don't we, uh, read through uh, a few pages and, and, and look at it and hope to read more, and sometimes do. But when I read through these uh, pages, I, I sat up straight. I mean, this was a beautiful book. Um, yesterday, uh, Catherine call, uh, called us. Uh, she was skiing in Vermont. I don't know where she found any snow, but she was skiing in Vermont, slipped, and uh, bruised her ribs too badly uh, to come today, which is hard to understand because we do ski safety in the program, too. But. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read from Tenney's Landing uh, for her. Uh, Catherine, I remember well, a tall, ruddy-cheeked girl who then went out to raise sheep uh, in Vermont. She called herself the ruddy-cheeked shepherdess uh, when she was uh, in contact. Uh, she has a novel coming out from Scribner um, in uh, August, I think, uh, and it's called American Cream. And I predict she, uh, with Hajin and Jumpa, Sue Miller, Arthur Golden, and, and many others, is going to be one of the finest graduates uh, of our program. I'm going to read from the, uh, the beginning of the um, second story, I think, from this book, or no, maybe it's the fourth. <laughs> uh, not much happens in it. I'm, the language is simple. The people are simple. The situation is not unusual. Uh, but you feel that life, real life, is uh, going by beneath your eyes as you, as you read. This story is called The Dowry. I'll just read the opening few pages. I heard Ed coming up our hill. I couldn't see him yet, but he just hit the steep part about halfway, and I recognized the low, the low growl of the engine as he downshifted. Ed was our closest neighbor, and he'd stop by to visit from time to time, maybe drop something off on his way back from town. I finished sweeping the oats where Starboy had kicked over the bucket that morning and hung the broom on the peg in the grain room and walked across the house to wait. I'm better off without these. I was standing on the porch steps when I saw his old blue pickup turn into our road, the dust swarming up behind it. The lane's about a quarter mile long, so at first I wasn't sure if someone was with him. As soon as I made out the girl, though, something about her made me think of back home, which was strange enough. Then there was the sky that morning, the mackerel sky we get in the early summer, a great sweep of pearly clouds that makes you think you're floating when you look at it. It was the same sky as the day I looked up and saw my father riding in on a pack mule. The lane was all ruts then, and him just a speck down at the end of it, but I knew him right away. He was a sorriest sight, never had ridden before, and didn't like it much, I could tell. So rumpled and dirty he was, coming on toward the cabin, it wasn't really a house yet, and hanging on to that pack saddle for dear life. Ed hopped out of the cab, grinning. Brought you a relative, Francis, he said. Didn't know you had any. He hoisted a big brown suitcase out of the back. Met her at the post office asking about you, and since I was heading this way, offered to give her a lift. The girl sat there a minute, taking me in. All I could think was, good Lord, my cousin, my cousin Hillary has died and sent me her daughter to raise, left me this child in her will. Then the girl climbed out and walked up to me, offering a handshake. When I saw her closer, I remembered that she would, that she would be too old to need raising. Aunt Frances, she said, I'm Carrie McKemson. 
That's plain as day, I told her, taking her hand. You look exactly like your mother and father put together. Ed sidled up to the porch and plunked her suitcase down. He pitched the brim of his hat. He pinched the brim of his hat and said, Be seeing you, ladies, and took off in another swirl of dust before maybe I could come to my senses and send this girl and her big suitcase back into town with him. So there I was, watching the back of Ed's truck, elbow to elbow, elbow with Hillary's girl. It was like she had dropped out of the sky. Wait until Jack sees you, I said. He's up in the high pasture checking the sheep. Jack's your husband? Yes, he is. Jack and I had been keeping house together for 25 years, which isn't a bad record. We had 200 lambs this spring. It's a lot to keep track of. I always imagined you had a sheep farm. Ranch, I corrected. Anyway, come on up and have a seat. She sat down in the rocker with a big sigh, like she had some bad news to deliver, which she did before I could say another word. Your father's dying, she told me. He might be dead already. It took me nearly three days to get here. Well now, I said, you aren't one to beat about the bush, are you? Starboy and Pan kicked up their heels all of a sudden and started prancing around the corral, sniffing the wind. I'd gotten a letter a couple of weeks before. My mother wrote to say that the old fellow had had a stroke, but he was out of the hospital, home in bed. She thought he might get better. The girl, Carrie, was staring at me as I watched the horses. Did they send you out here? No, I came on my own, uh, she said, on the train. What's your idea? I turned and tried to smile at her. You planning on taking me back? I wanted to meet you, that's all. She scratched her cheek and glanced over at the horses. I was at the farm visiting my grandparents, and I went into town with them to see your parents a few times, and then I just thought it would be good to find you. She seemed like an honest, well-meaning girl, and I was sorry to be making her uncomfortable. I took a seat in Jack's chair. We sat rocking on the porch, and she started talking about the town, Tenny's Landing, as if I would naturally want to hear all the news, such as it was. Her voice sounded the way Hillary's used to, a skittery young voice that ran up and down a couple of octaves in every sentence, a voice with a sense of humor in it. She told me about going with her grandparents, my Uncle Walter and Aunt Marion, to visit and, t and take dinner for my mother. While they were eating, my mother kept a plastic nursery monitor on the sideboard so she could listen in on my father. Kerry said they could hear him breathing. It was a huffing and puffing sound, a little weird. Anyway, one night last week, your mother put down her knife and fork and said, Aggie Moffat stopped by today with a peach pie for Owen. And she rolled her eyes at the ceiling. He can't eat anything like that, she said. Really, it's pretty much soup and pudding for him. All of a sudden, she looked around and said, You know what? I can't remember where I put it. Right then, there was a little chuckling sound on the monitor, and I imagine Uncle Owen sitting up in his bed, polishing off the last bite of pie. Listening to that voice of hers, I could just about smell the linoleum in my mother's kitchen, the pink and gray speckled linoleum she was so proud of. She used to scrub it twice a week with some pine cleaner my father said gave him a headache. By that time, Hillary's family had moved out to the farm, but she would come home with me after school on Fridays and spend the night. Her parents would pick her up the next day when they came to town to buy their groceries. Hillary and I always asked if we could have fried chicken for dinner. We liked to watch my mother making it almost as much as we liked eating it. She'd get the Crispo, Crisco smoking hot in her big black skillet, and while the chicken popped and sizzled in the oil, we'd set the table. Once my mother said, I'll tell you a little secret. Add some baking soda to your flour when you coat the chicken. When everything was ready, my dad and my brother Barrett would come to the table. My dad always said the same grace. Thank you, Lord, for these gifts we are about to receive. He didn't joke around as much as Uncle Walter, who sometimes said, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. After we cleaned up the dishes, we'd play gin rummy until bedtime. Hillary and Barrett always played as a team because he couldn't figure out the cards by himself. Carrie, I said, I haven't got any peaches, but how do you like cherry pie? Oh, that's fine, she said, looking a little wary. It's Jack's favorite, I told her. Come and help me pit these sour cherries. Thank you. Um.
Catherine's behalf. <laughs> and now, yet another poet, Rosanna Warren. Uh, I talked a bit about the translation seminar. It's a very special course at BU. In, in my opinion, probably the best course that BU has to offer anyone. Uh, on Fridays, I think it is, you hear the best translators from all over the world come in and discuss their craft. And on Mondays, you practice your, uh, that craft yourself uh, under Rosanna's direction. There is nothing quite like it. Uh, in the university or in any university that I know of. Uh, Rosanna has written uh, many books and won many awards. Uh, she's the one that makes me look forward to opening The New Yorker just in the hope that something might be there of hers. Her last book was, I think, Departures, is that right? And let's hear from Rosanna now. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I'm writing a sequence of poems uh, with the name Mistral, which is a pretty furious wind that blows down from the north of France into the south and bangs all the shutters and makes some people crazy. Mistral, one. Two donkeys graze in a meadow of wild golden buttons. Scents of eucalyptus and honeysuckle mingle in morning air. Distantly, down at the shore, rise the voices of children discovering things. Childhood burned with a long wick, I have come here to re examine the ashes. The gulls lament some tedious age-old woe as they skim off toward the harbor while the sun bores into and into the petaled whorls of the golden flowers like radiation, the whole meadow bristling with a heat that destroys and sustains. This doesn't matter to the donkeys who munch on regardless. Over my garden table, the sun casts a shadow lattice of ilex leaves an open weave that trembles across books and notebook pages, rearranging the words. Just as well, they were not the best words. I am willing to be rewritten, and let the printed poems of others be rewritten as well, and let them steep in the bitter smell of eucalyptus, which is said to heal. And may the dark fire far away, charring my friend's hurt cells, complete its work. Let him grow into his longer story, the good one, the one in which sunlight runs in the veins with the force of summer, and children find some new thing and shout at the sea. Mistral II. I gave myself to the Mistral, which had shouldered its way down from the north, leaping the careful fields of France, skimming the Alps, running the flat of its hands along the Rhone to careen over this stretch of ultramarine and ancient sea and seize the page out from under my pen. The high eucalyptus shudder and surge. The bamboo grove flashes its knives. Yesterday's poem flies off. We will all be changed in the quiet garden. I have broken some forms. I am waiting to see what survives this tumult of leaves and cloud light, what the sea will whip up from its jagged troughs when spray shatters against downward slicing veins of schist and the hills bracing the valley wither and groan. The garden stays pegged to earth with its round metal tables of pea soup green and its fan patterns raked in tawny dirt. And I stay pegged to the garden chair. But it was I who prayed yesterday to make this refuge cry with a different breath, hoping some new word would be snatched up out of my throat. Its salt tang could be from sea wind could be from tears. 
Mistral three. When she disappeared on the path ahead of me, I leaned against a twisted oak. All I saw was evening light where she had been, gold dust light where a moment before and 38 years before that, my substantial mother strode before me in straw hat, bathing suit and loose flapping shirt. Every summer afternoon, her knapsack light across her back, her step in sandals firm on the stony path as we returned from the beach. And I mulled small rebellions and observed the, the dwarfish cork trees with their pocky bark, wind-wrestled oaks with arms akimbo, while shafts of sea light stabbed down between the trunks. There was something I wanted to say at the age of 12, some question she hadn't answered. And yesterday, so clearly seeing her pace before me, it rose again to the tip of my tongue. And the mystery was not that she walked there 10 years after her death, but that she vanished and let twilight take her place. Thank you. John, I didn't see you come in here. How are you doing? Good. I'm going to squeeze myself in here. Um, and I'm going to read uh, from uh, my 1979 novel, uh, King of the Jews, uh, not because I'm trying to avoid my current novel that was just published, uh, but because it gives me a chance to plug the play that we're doing of, uh, <laughs> of King of the Jews. Uh, you all should have received this. Did many of you receive it? If, I, I'm going to leave a few extras in case you, in case you did. Uh, right there. February 21st through March 10th. And we have a wonderful cast. And uh, I, I think it will be a terrific, uh, a terrific production. And King of the Jews, as some of you know, uh, went through uh, much the same kind of reception uh, as my current novel from the same people for the same reasons. And uh, so in a way, I think I'm reading from both. <laughs> uh, this novel is uh, uh, set, uh, is based on the Lodz ghetto, Łódź ghetto in Poland. Um, you know that when the Germans swept uh, uh, eastward, uh, each town they went to, each city they went to, they set up a Jewish governing council uh, they could not do their nefarious work alone. They needed assistance. The most nefarious thing of all they did was get the Jews to do it for them. Um, and in the Lodz ghetto, there was an actual figure named um, Chaim uh, Rumkowski. And uh, Rumkowski was the king of the Jews. That he was, he, he, uh, he did things that every leader of a ghetto did. Um, but his crime, and he kept his ghetto going longer than any other. And if the Russians had swept westward, as it was certainly in their power to do, that ghetto would have been the only one to be saved, I believe, and he would be a hero. Uh, but they didn't. And what we remember him for now is not for what he did, but for the kind of pleasure he took in the power that he had. And that's what makes him such a fascinating figure. In the brief passage I'm going to read to you now, he did, he did uh, uh, love and care for children. And it's about that aspect of his character I'll read tonight. He was the king of the Jews, but when he dealt with his German overlords, he was a slave and he would lick the boots of them. And they would occasionally beat him for their pleasure. And we, as we see him now, he's just been beaten. He retreats without his cloak that he always wore, with his glasses shattered, to the garden of the orphanage that he runs. Late that same afternoon, Trumpelman arrived back at Sarskoye Selo. The Obergruppenfuhrer dropped him off in his new double six. The elder 
could hardly walk. His clothes were ripped, his cloak gone. There was only one lens left in his frame. He did not go into the mansion, but around it to the gardens and back. Though early in springtime, the fresh green stems of garlic were pushing out of the ground. Trumpelman sank down among them. Wearily, he shut his eyes. No telling how long he might have stayed there if Betsack, the schoolmaster, had not walked by carrying what looked like a gigantic squash. Smuggling, said the elder to himself, and keeping low, keeping hidden, he followed the young teacher to the edge of the plowed-up field. There are the orphans, both the old-timers and the ones who had joined the asylum in the last year before the move to the ghetto were waiting. They all had caps on and coats and were holding such things as nuts, the head of a cabbage, and a pink India rubber ball. The sun had dropped well down in the sky and the air was chilly now. Betsack was a thin fellow, poorly whiskered with threads that stuck up from his collar. He made his way to the center of the field, sat down the gourd, it was as big as a wash basin really, and began to call through his hands, stations, children, Positions, if you please. You, shifter, libel shifter, further back, further back. Tushnet, you go back too. The children began to scatter over the field. Shifter, the mad boy, the dog, kept going backward. Every minute or so he would stop, but Betsack waved him farther on until he was practically out of sight. Stop, the schoolmaster shouted, but Shifter still backpedaled, and the message to him had to be passed from orphan to orphan, from crystal to atlas to tushnet, across the length of the field. Finally, they all held still. Beth sat, bent down, and picked up the dried squash. He had just the strength to lift it over his head. The next thing you knew, the schoolmaster, a grown-up, responsible person, was rapidly spinning around. Flicker, he gasped to the boy who was nearest. Citron, he called to the lad next farthest out. Begin rotation. Trumpelman could hardly believe what he saw. Both boys, and then Guta Blit, and then all the others began to spin on the spot. It was like madness. Round and round they went, stepping all over their shadows. West to east, Mr. Atlas, not like a clock. Rose Atlas stopped. She reversed direction. The rest kept going, holding their little spheres. Betsack had begun to stagger a little. The breath came visibly from his mouth. Now, revolutions. Little Usher Flicker, between his fingers, he had a pea from a pod, began to trip around the teacher in a circle, more or less. And a bit farther out, Citron was doing the same. The amazing thing was that as both boys went in this circular orbit, they did not stop whirling about. Guta Blit, with a pink rubber ball, was spinning like a dervish too, and also crystal, and so was everyone soon. Even Libel Shifter, way out on the edge of the field, a half kilometer off, had started to run. However, because of the distance between him and Betsack, he hardly seemed to be moving. Flicker, for instance, had run three times about the center before Shifter, his legs thrashing, covered any noticeable ground. It would take him forever to complete a revolution. Attention, moons. Betsack, with red patches that showed through his beard, with his necktie coming undone, practically shrieked this. And from behind the hill that led to the cemetery grounds, 15, 20, more than 20 children came pouring. What they did with a whoop, with a shout, was to pick out some of the whirling orphans, Guta, Rose Atlas, the puffing man Lifshitz, and then begin to race as fast as they could around them. For a time, the whole field was covered with these whizzing children making circles inside of circles, curves within curves. Then Trumpelman stood up in the dimming light. He walked into their midst. Through his split, puffy lips, he demanded of the reeling Betsack, what is the meaning of this? Speak. The schoolmaster dropped his squash he started screaming. It's the whole solar system, including the new planet of Pluto, in correct proportions, according to the system of Sir J. Frederick Herschel. Then he threw his arms around the asylum director, clinging to him the way a drunkard does to a post. Just then, 
Nathan Hobnover, an eight-year-old boy, came roaring over the hilltop, making a sizzling sound. Zzzz. Comet, said Betzak, and sank down about Trumpleman's ankles. The exhausted children saw the old man in tatters. They wobbled to a halt. Man Lifshitz, whose heavy cabbage represented Jupiter, simply dropped, as did his 11 moons. One by one, the others collapsed. They lay on their backs with their coats spread, their breath coming up in a mist. Only the man from Vilna, Trumpleman, for all his scratches and bruises, remained on his feet. Then he sat down, too. Tushnet caught his breath before anyone else and addressed the schoolmaster. Sir, what will happen when the sun goes out? He was some way off, but it was so still you could easily hear him. Betzak said, what do you mean, Tushnet? It, it goes down. It does not go out. I mean, when it burns up. Will we burn up, too? A high voice broke in. It can't just go on forever. Sometime it has to run out of fuel. Oh, that's only a thicker, a theory, Flicker. It has not been proved. But what if it's true? What then? Everything will be dark. It makes me nervous. That was Rose Atlas. I don't think it'll burn up, said Man Lifshitz from his spot on the ground. It'll just get colder and colder. Everything on Earth will get colder, too. It will be like the Ice Age. Nothing but ice. But it scares me, Rose replied. Listen, said Betzak, this is speculation. In any case, it won't happen for thousands of years. See, you said it was going to happen. It's going to happen. Someone else says, we'll all be frozen to death. Please, their instructor said, why do you worry? In a thousand years, none of us will be alive. Remember, these are children about to die in the ghetto. I don't care. I don't want it to go out. I hate the idea of the cold. Another says, I do too. And another says, no one alive. No one. There won't even be animals on the earth. It's terrible. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. The children began to whimper and moan. So Betzak spoke in a loud, firm voice. Pay attention, if you please. The sun is not going to stop burning. It's made in a certain way. And even if it should go out, after all, by then men will have invented spaceships, and they will fly off to live somewhere else, to other planets, to other worlds. There is nothing that science cannot achieve. Perhaps in the universe we shall meet other forms of life. Perhaps even people just like ourselves. Think of that. What a wonderful day that will be. How much we shall learn. The moaning had completely stopped. Everything was quiet. Then, so that everyone's heart leaped and pounded, there was an awful wail from Libel Shifter. Help! I'm so far away. Help! I'm afraid. Trumpleman, sitting upright, answered, Come, all of you, come closer. Silently, on all fours, the boys and girls began to crawl toward the center. They drew near to Trumpleman, who, through his swollen eyes, his single lens, was staring off to the west. They looked, too. There on the horizon, the real sun was leaking something. Red stuff, like jam, came out of it and spread over the nearby sky. Like a raspberry drop, said Usher Flicker. He took the elder's hand. Citron, a new boy, had curly blonde hair coming from under his cap. He laid his head across the elder's knees. Dark Guta Blit leaned on his shoulder. It's beautiful, she whispered, gazing off to where the sun, cut by the earth's edge, still pumped the sweet-looking syrup from its center. All the children, the planets, the satellites, hobbed over the comet, and at last even Shifter, pressed close to Trumpleman and to each other. They were like his missing cave. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we're uh, going to hear from uh, 
my ex-student, my colleague and my friend, uh, Ha Jin. Uh, he just writes these wonderful books. Um, uh, he writes Waiting and wins the National Book Award. He writes um, a War Trash and wins the uh, Penn Faulkner. Uh, and I hope, uh, and, and, and soon there will be a, uh, a new novel, his first set in America. Uh, but I do hope that um, with all this acclamation for his later work, which will only grow, we don't forget the earliest of his books of fiction. Uh, the first one um, was uh, entirely written in our workshop, every story in it. Um, and the name of it is called Love, Ocean of Words. And um, the second book, uh, which is in some ways my favorite book of his of all, Under the Red Flag, was largely written uh, in our workshops. Uh, it's uh, one of our proudest accomplishments, I think. Ha Jin. In fact, I've been writing short stories, uh, but after writing novels for a number of years, uh, I somehow I lost the rhythm, I, I, I think. Um, but gradually, gradually I'm coming back to uh, the feel of a short fiction, how to write short fiction. And uh, in fact, I realized a, a novelist thinks differently from a short story writer um, because as a short story writer, uh, you can't think in terms of chapters and the sections. You have to really focus on the small details and uh, sentences. Very often, it is the language that really makes a big difference. Uh, this is a, a first story published in my, uh, in the next book I'm, I'm working at. Uh, all the stories are supposed to set in the States. And this one is called uh, A Composer and His Parakeets. Uh, the, <coughs> the composer is composing a, a opera and he had a, his girlfriend, Indian girlfriend, left a bird <coughs> to his care. And the bird couldn't speak. Uh, I'm going to read two episodes from this, uh, this story. Upon signing the contract for a blind musician three months earlier, the librettist, an uh, exiled poet living on Staten Island, had insisted that the composer mustn't change a single word of the libretto. The writer, Ben Yong, didn't understand that unlike poetry, opera, is a public form of art. It depends on collaborative efforts. Albert Chang liked the libretto so much, he conceded to the terms the author demanded. This, however, posed a problem for Fan Lin, who had in mind a musical, musical structure that didn't always agree with the verbal text. Furthermore, some words were unsingable such as smoothest and feudalism. He had to replace them, ideally, with words ending with open vowels. One morning, Fallin set out for Staten Island to see Ban Yun, intending to get permission to change some words. He didn't plan to take Bori along, but the second he stepped out of his apartment, he heard the bird bump against the door repeatedly, scratching the wood. He opened the door and said, want to come with me? The parakeet leaped to his chest, clutching his t-shirt and uttering tiny chirps. Finally, caressed the bori, and together they headed for the train station. It was a fine sum summer day, the sky washed clean by a shower the previous night. On the ferry boat, Fanlin stayed on the deck all the way, watching seabirds wheel around. Some strutted or scurried on the bow, where two small girls were tossing bits of bread at them. Bori joined the other birds, picking up food, but didn't, 
but not eat any, eating any. Finally knew the parakeet was doing it just for fun, yet no matter how he called, the bird wouldn't come back to him. So he stood by, watching Bori walk excitedly among gulls, terns, petrels. He was amazed that Bori wasn't afraid of the bigger birds, and wondered and wondered if the parakeet was lonely at home. Ben Yong received Fan Lin warmly, as if they were friends. In fact, they were met only twice, both occasions for business. Fan Lin liked this man, who, already 43, hadn't lost the child in him, and often threw his head back and laughed aloud. Sitting on a sofa in the living room, Fan Lin sang some lines to demonstrate the cumbersomeness of the original words. He had an ordinary voice, a bit hoarse, yet whenever he sang his own compositions, he was confident and expressive, with a vivid face and vigorous gestures, as if he were oblivious of anyone else's presence. While Fan Lin was singing, Bori frolicked on the coffee table, flapping his wings and wagging his head, his hooted bill opening and closing, and emitting happy but unintelligible cries. Then the bird paused to tap his feet as if beating time, which delighted the poet. Can he talk? Ben Yu asked Fan Lin. No, he can't, but he's smart, even knows money. You should teach him how to talk. Come here, little fellow. Ben Yu beckoned to the bird, who ignored his outstretched hand. Without difficulty, Fan Lin got the librettist's agreement on the condition that they talk before Fan Lin made any wording changes. For lunch, they went to a small restaurant nearby and each had a pan-fried pizza. Dabbing his mouth with a red napkin, Ben Yong said, I love this place and have lunch here five times a week. Sometimes I work on my poems in here. Cheers, he lifted his beer and clinked it with Fan Lin's water. Fan Lin was amazed by what the poet said. Ben Yong didn't hold a regular job and could hardly have made any money from his writing. Few people in his situation would die out five times a week. In addition, he enjoyed movies and popular music. Two tall shelves in his apartment were loaded with CDs, more with DVDs. Evidently, the writer was well kept by his wife, a nurse. Fan Lin was touched by the woman's generosity. After lunch, they strolled along the beach of white sand, carrying their shoes and walking barefoot. The air smelled fishy, tinged with the stink of seaweed washed ashore. Bori liked the ocean and kept flying away, skipping along the brink of the surf, pecking at the sand. Ah, this sea breeze is so invigorating, Ben Yong said as he watched Bori. Whatever, whenever I walk here, the view of the ocean makes me think a lot. Before this immense body of water, even life and death become unimportant, irrelevant. What's important to you then? Art, only art is immortal. That's why you've been writing full time all along. Yes, I want only to be a free artist. Fan Lin said no more. Unable to suppress the image of Ben Yong's self-sacrificing wife, a photo in their study showed her to be quite pretty, with a wide but handsome face. The wind increased, and dark clouds were gathering on the sea in the distance. As the ferry boat cast off, rain clouds were billowing over Brooklyn, soundless lightning zigzagging across the sky. On deck, a man, skinny and gray-bearded, was ranting about the evil doing of big corporations. Eyes shut, he cried, brothers and sisters, think about who gets all the money that's yours. Think about who puts all the drugs on the streets to kill our kids. I know them. I see them sinning against our Lord every day. 
what this country needs is a revolution, so we can put every crook behind the bars or ship them all to Cuba. Fallon was fascinated by the way words poured out of the man's mouth, as if the fellow were possessed by a demon, his eyes radiating a steely light. Few other passages pay him any mind. While Fanlin focused his attention on the man, Bori left Fanlin's shoulder and fluttered away towards the waves. Come back, come back, Fanlin called, but the bird went on flying along the boat. Suddenly, a gust of wind caught Bori and swept him into the tumbling water. Bori, Bori, Fanlin cried, rushing towards the stern, his eyes fastened on the bird, bobbing in the tumult. He kicked off his sandals, plunged into the water, and swam toward Bori, still calling his name. A wave crashed into Fanlin's face and filled his mouth with seawater. He coughed and lost the sight of the bird. Bori, Bori, where are you? He called, looking around fra frantically. Then he saw the parakeet lying subine on the slope of a swell about 30 yards away. With all his might, Fanlin plunged towards the bird. Behind him, the boat slowed and a crowd gathering on the deck. A man shouted through a bullhorn, Don't panic! We are coming to help you. At last, Fanlin grabbed hold of Bori, who was already motionless, his bill ajar. Tears gushed out of Fanlin's saw-stung eyes as he held the parakeet and looked into his face, turning him upside down to drain water out of his crop. Meanwhile, the boat circled back, chugging toward Fanlin. A ladder dropped from the boat, Holding Bori between his teeth, Fanning hauled himself out of the water. When he reached the deck, the gray-bearded man stepped over and handed Fanning his sandals without a word. People massed around as Fanning laid the bird on the steel deck and gently pressed Bori's chest with two fingers to pump water from the lifeless body. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and lightning cracked the, the city's skyline, but patches of sunlight still fell on the ocean. As the boat picked up speed heading north again, the bird's knotted feet opened, then clawed the air. He's come to, a man exclaimed. Sluggishly, Bori opened his eyes. Cheerful cries broke out on the deck, while Fanlin sobbed gravely. A middle-aged woman took two photos of Fanlin and the parakeet, saying, this is extraordinary. <laughs> two days later, a short article appeared in the Metro section of the New York Times, reporting on the rescue of the bird. It described how Fanlin had plunged into the ocean without a second thought and patiently resuscitated Bori. The piece was brief, under 200 words, but it, but it created some buzz in the local community. Within a week, a small Chinese language newspaper, the North American Tribune, printed a long article on Fallon and his parakeet with a photo of them together. And then something terrible happened to the bird and the, the composer <laughs> is, <laughs> is devastated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The largest of writers uh, care for the smallest of things, I think. <laughs> and at the beginning uh, of that piece, Hajin spoke of, uh, of working on the opera libretto. And he knows whereof he speaks. Uh, I should have said that his most recent work uh, has, was a libretto for the uh, opera, The First Emperor, uh, which I saw in New York and which is exhilarating. I hope you all get a chance to see it. And we're going to close uh, with uh, uh, Louise uh, Gluck. Um, Gluck, sorry. 
there are those who would say um, that she's America's great poet, and um, I would say so too. Uh, she's won everything it's possible uh, to win, uh, and, and perhaps even more. Uh, she was uh, with us last year, this year, and I hope in the future. Uh, she is currently the um, Rosencrantz uh, writer in residence at Yale, and it's simply amazing that she has agreed to be the Guildenstern Professor of Poetry <laughs> <laughs> at BU in the future. <laughs> Louise. <laughs> Thank you. It's late. I'll be brief. I'll read some new poems. Twilight. All day he works at his cousin's mill, so when he gets home at night, he always sits at this one window, sees one time of day, twilight. There should be more time like this to sit and dream. It's as his cousin says, living, living takes you away from sitting. In the window, not the world, but a squared off landscape representing the world. The seasons change, each visible only a few hours a day. Green things followed by golden things, followed by whiteness, abstractions from which come intense pleasures like the figs on the table. At dusk, the sun goes down in a haze of red fire between two poplars. It goes down late in summer. Sometimes it's hard to stay awake. Then everything falls away. The world for a little longer is something to see, then only something to hear, crickets, cicadas, or to smell sometimes, aroma of lemon trees, of orange trees. Then sleep takes this away also. But it's easy to give things up like this, experimentally, for a matter of hours. I open my fingers, I let everything go. Visual world, language, rustling of leaves in the night, smell of high grass, of wood smoke. I let it go, then I light the candle. Tributaries. All the roads in the village unite at the fountain. Avenue of Liberty, Avenue of the Acacia Trees. The fountain rises at the center of the plaza on sunny days, rainbows in the piss of the cherub. In summer, couples sit at the pool's edge. There's room in the pool for many reflections. The plaza's nearly empty. The acacia trees don't get this far. And the avenue of liberty is barren and austere. Its image doesn't crowd the water. Interspersed with the couples, mothers with their younger children. Here's where they come to talk to one another, maybe meet a young man, see if there's anything left of their beauty. When they look down, it's a sad moment. The water isn't encouraging. The husbands are off working, but by some miracle, all the amorous young men are always free. They sit at the edge of the fountain, splashing their sweethearts with fountain water. Around the fountain, there are clusters of metal tables. This is where you sit when you're old, beyond the intensities of the fountain. The fountain is for the young who still want to look at themselves, or for the mothers who need to keep their children diverted. A few old people linger at the tables. Life is simple now, one day cognac, one day coffee and a cigarette. To the couples, it's clear who's on the outskirts of life, who's at the center. 
The children cry, they sometimes fight over toys. But the water's there to remind the mothers that they love these children, that for them to drown would be terrible. <laughs> the mothers are tired constantly, the children are always fighting, the husbands at work or angry. No young man comes. The couples are like an image from some far away time, an echo coming very faint from the mountains. They're alone at the fountain in the dark well. They've been exiled by the world of hope, which is the world of action, but the world of thought hasn't as yet opened to them. When it does, everything will change. Darkness is falling, the plaza empties. The first leaves of autumn litter the fountain. The roads don't gather here anymore. The fountain sends them away back into the hills they came from. Avenue of broken faith, avenue of disappointment, avenue of the acacia trees of olive trees, the wind filling with silver leaves, avenue of lost time, avenue of liberty that ends in stone, not at the field's edge, but at the foot of the mountain. The last poem I'll read is called Walking at Night. Now that she is old, the young men don't approach her, so the nights are free. The streets at dusk that were so dangerous have become as safe as the meadow. By midnight, the town's quiet. Moonlight reflects off the stone walls. On the pavement, you can hear the nervous sounds of the men rushing home to their wives and mothers. This late, the doors are locked, the windows darkened. When they pass, they don't notice her. She's like a dry blade of grass in a field of grasses, so her eyes that used never to leave the ground are free now to go where they like. When she's tired of the streets, in good weather she walks in the fields where the town ends. Sometimes in summer she goes as far as the river. The young people used to gather not far from here, but now the river's grown shallow from lack of rain, so the banks deserted. There were picnics then. The boys and girls eventually paired off. After a while, they made their way into the woods where it's always twilight. The woods would be empty now. The naked bodies have found other places to hide. In the river, there's just enough water for night sky to make patterns against the gray stones. The moon's bright, one stone among many others, and the wind rises. It blows the small trees that grow at the river's edge. When you look at a body, you see a history. Once that body isn't seen anymore, the story it tried to tell gets lost. On nights like this, she'll walk as far as the bridge before she turns back. Everything still smells of summer, and her body begins to seem again, the body she had as a young woman, glistening under the light summer clothing. Thank you. Well, that's who we are, and that's the work we do, and thank you so much for coming.